Okay, good morning, bon dia, guys. Um, it was great yesterday evening. I really enjoyed the company and discussions and food. Um, we'll finish today with uh, um, two kind of different lectures. The first one will be demonstration of the application of this idea of resilience. So you can see the two systems, they're connected, one in a prototype form and another one in a kind of final form that we have developed to demonstrate how you can use the, uh, how you can use the idea of resilience as a decision-making criteria for municipal uh, uh, flooding conditions. And the second one, after the break, I'll be talking more about general modeling of the impact of climate change on the extremes um, in a kind of national setup. So the large-scale study done for the whole country of Canada, you will see, you know, the methodology, I think, may be of some value, but also you can see how um, at least Canada will be exposed to, you know, changing conditions or what the consequences are. Um, I'll go quickly through the same set of slides that you already have seen uh, about the idea of resilience um, and the, the, the needs that are coming from these changing conditions in the form of more complex problems and more uncertainty that will be coming from various sources from, uh, you know, lack of information to uh, a very dramatic change that may occur in the land use, in population, in climate, and the impacts of these things on the infrastructure in various forms. I like this picture. This is the picture from the same flood that I was telling you about on the Red River. This, is, this, was a, this was a flood of the century, and this was the main highway connecting Canada and United States in that region. And you see how it looked like after the, after the flood. This is uh, also the same kind of uh, uh, picture. Uh, U.S. border is about 85 kilometers from this. This is the entrance into the city of Winnipeg. And a very large structure is used to protect the city. It's a, it's a floodway that takes the water of the river around the city, basically doubling the capacity through the city and allowing protection for the city. However, from the structure to the south, to the U.S. border, uh, it was uh, like an ocean. <laughs> you were not able to see. I have a friend who has a small plane and she gave me a kind of tour. So we were flying on a given at, you know, at the altitude because of the army being involved. And from the city to the U.S. border and back, you, from that altitude, we were not able to see anything except water. It was like a 2,700 square kilometers of land, fully, fully inundated. Really impressive things, yeah. You've seen these pictures. Um, um, what, you know, we started doing after this concept was a little bit developed. We started kind of implementation, and the implementation was in the form of kind of bringing now this idea, the calculation of the resilience you remember as the area under the performance curve um, into some um, little bit more little bit more uh, realistic context so that it can be uh, demonstrated to those that may have benefits of it. So what we started with, we started with some kind of prototype uh, uh, development for the web, uh, for the web so that, you know, we can use that in presentations and discussions. And then based on this prototype, uh, we started very intensive discussions with the City of Toronto to see if we can get them on board <laughs> to um, uh, basically work with us. That was a huge effort. I met so many presentations there. I talked to so many people. We spent so much time <laughs> and it didn't succeed. The, the, the simply the hierarchy within the city and um, the way how the city is uh, protecting the information and really, really hesitant to share all this information prevented us from really uh, uh, successfully implementing this. But I pushed the development to the end with the publicly available data and the system is um, now being uh, available, made available, but the contacts with the city, I abandoned that effort. I think it's a waste of effort and time. 
in the development of both prototype and uh, uh, final, I call this final system, so you see the difference is only the letter T. Both of them are available on web, publicly you can access and uh, use and see. Uh, the, the idea was very similar as like an IDF tool that I was talking about yesterday where the kind of user interface uh, model base and database are integrated but in this particular case we had a little bit more complex structure because of the idea of interactive support for decision making and you're going to see how that looked like. Um, so maybe instead of going through the slides I'll I, my plan was to demonstrate the pr prototype system so we can kind of go together, you can see, you know, what, what is the idea and how we build the structure. And then I'll walk you through the slides through the um, full-scale system. Full-scale system requires much more time for demonstration and presentation. You will see why, because it has many options and opportunities. And this prototype is a nice for kind of relatively faster walk through. Uh, so, in the prototype, we developed uh, databases and uh, information for two locations, for the City of London and City of Toronto. And in that uh, prototype, we really limited, limited the use to, um, to uh, already pre-existent studies done on the impact of flooding um, in, these two, in these two regions. Um, so, I will be switching to the web, the, okay, uh, the address is here on top and you can see, um, you can access that very easily, there is no registration, there is none, this, this is the kind of demo system and you can have um, kind of uh, um, interaction with the system for both, uh, for both of the cities. So w what the purpose of the prototype was is to kind of show um, how in the case of urban flooding um, you, can utilize the, you can utilize the resilience as a really criteria in real time to compare various response, uh, response options and response actions. Um, the, system, the system has kind of, uh, as you can see, three major parts on the left-hand side is the information presented for the uh, kind of location. You can kind of zoom in, zoom out. All the information is, as you can see, uh, in this uh, spatial, with this spatial resolution that I was mentioning earlier, that's the so-called dissemination area. For these dissemination areas, we have by the Census Canada, all the information about the population land use and lots of details that can be of value in calculating, in calculating the resilience. What you see here is a basically downtown area of London. Uh, uh, there are two, uh, two branches of the Thames River that are just joining in downtown. This is South Branch, this is the North Branch. And from this point on, the, the river becomes a Thames and flows into uh, uh, flows south, basically to uh, the Great Lakes. It goes into Lake Erie. Um, the, the 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 river is also flooding um, relatively often. There are number of structures within the city as well as outside of the city that are kind of designed to provide the protection of the city for, from flooding. The key structures are the reservoir, which is upstream on the northern branch by the airport, London airport, and this reservoir is really designed to just store the spring runoff and reduce the peak and delay the uh, flows. And in the city areas, very, the, at various locations, depending on elevation, different types of protection structure. This particular area, that's why I kind of zoomed in here, is very sensitive. Um, the whole area on the, on the left-hand side is very low-lying area, residential area. All the homes are located there. And uh, therefore, the authority uh, responsible for flood protection has built first the dike, 
and then the dike was recently replaced with a flood wall that is providing the protection of the whole area. The flood wall is built on this, along the river. And on the right-hand side, there is a relatively flat area, which is basically used as a park, and then naturally uh, a higher elevation of the downtown city, which didn't need uh, protection. So in the case of flooding, what is happening here, this side is protected by the flood wall. The water will spill in this area and, you know, as a small kind of retention, but that's a park and it's used for that and will not be, the damage will not be uh, uh, kind of created. Okay, so what, what we have done in this case, um, we provided the results of the number of flood uh, uh, related studies in the form of the inundation maps. So you have a choice of different type of flood. These are, so, so, so this is done by you know, doing traditional climate hydrological hydraulic analysis. Um, and it was stored in the, in the system as a set of inundation maps. Um, if you click on the particular, on the particular map, um, you will see the, in the blue and the shades of blue are indicating the water depth. You will see you know, how far and where the inundation, the inundation will occur. Um, if you select different map and a different return period, you will get uh, you know, the data also for that. So in, in this particular case, this is already pre, uh, pre prepared and uploaded into the system just for the uh, kind of demonstration purposes. But in, in a full scale system, this is actually part that should be done in real time, pending on the precipitation input and so on. Um, uh, by selecting the area, you can immediately <laughs> upload into the database for this particular region all the information about the exposed population, infrastructure properties, and, and so on. So this kind of interaction um, and use of the dissemination areas as the spatial units was convenient because of the data that's available from the Census uh, Canada and that we were able to immediately bring into the database. Um, there is a kind of information about the system on the left hand side uh, to help the people understand what the tool is doing, what software we used, what uh, you know, the contacts are. We also provided information about the data and uh, different sources of data. Uh, and you can see what we have done here. We kind of combined the Statistics Canada, which is a publicly available information about the population, economic, social, and all other indicators. We utilized, this was provided by the City of London. Um, this is the uh, database uh, of the properties and the value of the properties, and in this case, um, our uh, London city is paying a company that takes care of that. So it stores the information about all homes and buildings in the city and their value. That value is kind of updated according to the changes on the real estate market. And this particular company is only responsible to kind of do that. Uh, the the in infrastructure data, the so road, railways, uh, uh, bridges and everything else are kind of obtained from the engineering infrastructure database. And this is all kind of taken and stored again, you know, independently into the database of the tool. So you don't uh, actually have a delay in searching the web and uh, accessing other databases. Uh, this is being done by the tool on a regular basis and the tool directly communicates with the data or takes the data from the database. Um, we are also provided um, uh, lots of this information to the users. So basically, these are all the accessible links that will um, allow users to download the data if they want and if they need, if they want to continue doing their analysis and so on. So it's a very much open and it's, a, it's relying on the available information. Of, uh, available information. The spatial data is kind of stored in these uh, GIS maps and 
you know, multiple, uh, multiple information that's uh, relevant for, uh, spatial information that's relevant for this is basically stored in that particular form. Here, when you click, you have basically the list of different maps from, you know, very traditional, uh, like elevation and the DMs to the maps that are covering the outcomes of the hydrologic, hydraulic analysis of the potential flooding for the different return periods and so on. So, so this is the way how you can actually bring this information if you are doing the analysis on a side uh, into the system just by bringing the full scale, uh, full scale spatial information into the into the system. You can, you know, search these maps, you can zoom in, zoom out. I don't know how to do this with the mouse that's hardly working. Um, so you can get a lot of uh, levels of detail and also different ways of, you know, presenting the, presenting the maps and, you know, inquiring the, or sorry, and, and querying the, querying the, the, the spatial, spatial data. Um, there is a docu documentation that's available, and, and this is again in our, you know, the blue book <laughs> in providing the details. You can download this kind of blue book, it describes fully the system, all the data and everything else. And that's a kind of support because, you know, this is not a commercial product that you can kind of call. And, uh, um, uh, to utilizing this uh, kind of side menu, uh, you can actually perform the analysis. And the, the two kind of pieces of information are essential for understanding and how to perform the analysis. Uh, the first one um, is related to the kind of system performance measure. So if you remember the, our resilience curve and selection of the performance indices, indicators first, and then integration to calculate the resilience. We opted in this particular case for three different types of system performance measures. One was related to transportation or the roads, because that's essential for the movement through the city, and the measure is, you know, basically length of roads being inundated in kind of kilometers. The second one is related to number of people being affected, and this is essentially in the case if the people need to be evacuated or any other type of assistance needs to be, uh, needs to be provided. And in, 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 in our case, this is a really good opportunity that Census Canada is collecting a lot of information about the population because in some cases even you know, not being able to communicate in English language could be a major obstacle during the, you know, crisis or during the process of uh, uh, evacuation. So all this information is available. The population in different age groups, the origin, the language, the, the financial state of the family or the individual, because that's also playing the role who needs major help and who can actually help him or herself and so on. And then uh, the third set of performance measures was related to the infrastructure protection and we decided as a measure to use basically the number of buildings. This is a really the highest possible level. Obviously there are differences between the buildings and the use. Um, this is where you can kind of expand and add the value of the building, add the interruption to, you know, uh, functioning of the, you know, if the buildings are commercial and things like that. So, so there is opportunity to really expand this list uh, significantly if you want. And the final one that we selected is the economic damage in Curacao, basically the total number of dollars of uh, damage due to, the, due to the inundation. In order to calculate the resilience, um, we provided in this tool option to bring different measures that will be reducing the potential impact of flooding, okay? So these are the adaptation options. 
the system has already uh, incorporated the set of adaptation options. And now as a user, you have opportunity to look at the particular location, to find out what are the consequences of potential flooding, and then you experiment with different options to see how the resilience will change and possibly help yourself in choosing the option that will be the best fitted for the particular location. So uh, just here we are providing the description of these adaptation options. We divided them into two sets, same as if you recall the calculation of the resilience proactive and reactive. Proactive focusing on the first part, how fast you are losing the performance and what is the minimum level of performance and the active, sorry, reactive measures which are affecting the recovery of the system and the time that's required for the system, uh, for the system to recover. Uh, again, these are pre-selected and in the final tool that I'm just going to walk through, all this is basically open to the user. So user creates the measures, user kind of provides the input. In this demo, we kind of pre-selected these measures so that you can interactively basically uh, work with them, but you cannot change them uh, uh, through the system. So as a proactive measures, uh, we selected some interventions on the kind of local level uh, around the property, and we call them lot level flood protection measures. These are the smaller covering the openings, for example, at the lower level, moving the insides within the house to higher elevation. In our case, um, uh, in Canadian case, the basements of the homes are used and developed. So usually people are putting pretty expensive electronic equipment, you know, videos and others, uh, some exercising equipment, and that space, and if inundated, and it is first inundated <laughs> if anything happens, creates pretty significant damage. Um, also, most of our utilities within the homes are located in the, in the basement. Um, the, heaters, uh, the heating equipment, cooling equipment, the water heaters, everything is downstairs and it's a very easy, very easy if the water enters to actually experience pretty high level of damage. So some ways of protecting water from entering into the home is a very relevant measure in reducing the potential damage. Um, so uh, you will see we kind of created a number of these lot level protection measures and in the system you can kind of play with the level of, you know, how much you would like to put into this measure and um, it's, a, it's a kind of interactive uh, slider that allows you to kind of see the impacts of various uh, levels of uh, uh, protection. Uh, the second uh, proactive measure was related to infrastructure, the roads the, uh, and, and, and other things and basically maintenance of that because in many Canadian cities that's a very significant issue. The maintenance is not sufficient, the funds are not sufficient and you know the infrastructure is not being maintained and in the case of any kind of uh, you know major, uh, major rainfall, flooding or something happening, the damage is basically caused by not properly maintained infrastructure, not as much as the external factors like how long it was inundated or something like that. So we thought this is a good measure to see what the impact on it, the resilience are. And, this, and the third proactive measure was actually making the infrastructure a little bit more robust by twinning it or, or hardening the infrastructure, basically introducing some structural measures uh, uh, that can be that can be increasing the level of uh, level of protection. In the second group of react, so so these measures are mostly affecting the first part of the resilience diagram, you know, how fast the slope of the loss part and, uh, and the level or the robustness, the level of minimum uh, performance. So all of them are kind of reflected in the change of that. On the other side, um, on the second part of the diagram, <laughs> this set of measures are selected that will change the kind of uh, 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 slope of the recovery curve and also affect the total time that's required for the system to re, re, uh, uh, re reach the, 
the level of performance and basically bring the resilience to uh, possibly the, the initial level or um, somewhere close to it. In this set, again, uh, relatively, you know, based on our experience with the particular region, we selected the measures, but I'm telling you that's only for the kind of prototype purpose. Um, temporary diking is one very commonly used in Canada if you experience the city over the dike at a particular location, if the dikes are not. Uh, maintained to the proper level, we put so-called sandbags, and the sandbags are provided a temporary protection. They can resist the load and, you know, keep the water uh, um, out for a shorter period of time, but they're not a permanent measure, and when the water goes through, uh, it is, um, uh, they are not f serving the purpose. But as a temporary measure, that's a very common measure, and on everywhere in Canada that's used. Um, the flood that I was showing you for the Winnipeg, the flood of the century, about 6.5 million sandbags were used during that flood throughout the city at the particular small lower lying locations. And that was a city fully protected by the serious infrastructure. And these are only for the kind of local purpose. So you see that's a huge effort, you know, to do that. Um, the another temporary measure that is kind of reactive is pumping the water from the areas being inundated. In Toronto, when I was showing that summer flood and a highway being uh, inundated, for example, pumping was immediately implemented in order to move that water as soon as possible and return the highway back into a regular, uh, regular function. So that's a commonly used, these are mobile pumps in the city uh, officials, they bring them and take the water from low-lying areas. You have, a, for example, the, the pass is under the rail and uh, so usually these are low-lying lo uh, low locations and these locations are sensitive and they can stop the traffic. So, you know, the kind of pumping of the flooded areas and taking care of them is a good uh, reactive measure. Obviously, evacuation was included uh, in the, if the need is to move the people. Um, allocation of the resources, money, technological information, human resources was another kind of reactive measures. And also the response time, in a sense, you know, how fast the measures were uh, uh, to be implemented. So again, I'm just saying pre-selected set of measures, not implying that these are <laughs> the best measures, but only to kind of use in this demo to show, uh, to show how um, you can use the resilience as the decision criteria. Okay, um, for, the, for the analysis part, as you can see, uh, we allowed through this interaction to show the graphs as I was kind of presenting the idea of calculating resilience. So um, by uh, selecting the region of interest and selecting the kind of measures, the user is able to uh, present all the uh, different system performance measures and uh, also it's able to, uh, to show the resilience, uh, resilience curves. And, you know, my kind of vision was that something like this can be implemented for, uh, you know, some real-time urban environments in real time on a tablet and the technicians can go out and immediately after the rainfall identify what are the areas uh, uh, under consideration and immediately test various potential options and basically in a real time utilize this to, uh, uh, to coordinate the effort. Obviously that remains as a vision and how and how fast this will be applied depends on the municipalities, but um, I don't have very high hope, I must tell you, <laughs> for now, but... Um, okay, so let me kind of show you uh, how this works. Um, um, let's say this is, in, I already mentioned that this is in an interesting area because it's a downtown and it's a, a lot of people living in this particular part of the city. 
um, and uh, where the, the flood wall is implemented as the permanent measure for the protection. I'll select this particular unit um, and um, this is for the 250 year flood. You see that the inundation or the flood is kind of covering almost the whole territory of the particular unit. On the right hand side, so, so the options that I was describing are uh, on the adaptation options are on the right hand side of the screen and on the left hand side of the screen you have the results of the analysis. Uh, selection of the kind of area of interest, uh, system performance measures, and resilience uh, uh, measures. And what is uh, kind of interesting um, is that the system actually can show in the real time the difference between no option and uh, selected option. You create the option, adaptation option, by combining the measures that are like, okay, so these are the proactive measures, so lot level protection. Uh, we did not use the real units. We decided to, for now, just keep in the demo uh, uh, the percentage value or effort um, between zero and 100, and that's kind of easier because for different locations and for different measures, you will need different units, and that may be um, for the demo. For, for the full-scale system, we did that, but for the demo, no. And you can easily kind of change this and, you know, levels, and the system immediately does the calculation and the response to that. Um, I told you for proactive, we have a lot level protections, maintenance of infrastructure, hardening of infrastructure, and so on. And if you want to kind of uh, see that for the selected level of adaptation, uh, the system does the calculation and in this set of graphs, all the uh, impacts are uh, presented. The yellow uh, curves represent the pre-adaptation situation and the blue are the consequence of my choice of these adaptation measures. And we have now all these indices that I mentioned. Um, this is the kilometers of the road. So that's a, um, this mouse is really, um, so, so this is the, the, it says system performance uh, uh, roads. Then we have a social information, uh, number of people affected, you have a, who I cannot read. Um, there is economic damage. All the all what I can was reading, so they are presented in the form of the uh, graphs. The number of infrastructure elements, um, the total damage, and they are all kind of presented. Uh, presented, so you can download this information. You can see. Uh, also, you can observe, for example, what will be the response if you change the measures. You see the calculation is immediately redone and uh, the user can immediately... So, so this was my idea that you can in real time kind of respond to what you see, what is happening. You change the measures and you make a decisions either to you know, bring more people, bring equipment, and basically you guide the response process with the system like this. Uh, the same is basically happening by changing the, changing the reactive measures from, you know, the dikes to ev evacuation to um, timing and everything else. So the system is very responsive and does the calculation. And all this is done using the data which is in the database for that location that I have selected on the first screen on the map. Um, so now you can repeat that for various locations. Where do you need to do that? You can kind of add these uh, impacts together and so on. Um, these graphs are just used immediately to calculate the resilience. So in the third way, you can kind of present, um, present the resilience. And it's the same way. You have a yellow, sorry, or the orange curve, which is a without any <laughs> protection, you see the level of resilience being much lower. And then with the combined choice of the adaptation measures, we get the, uh, the blue one. You can easily read what is the, you know, the, the robustness level. You can even find out, uh, you know, or you see the time 
uh, when it, this is happening, so you realize how fast the system is losing performance. Um, you can also get the estimate of the total time for recovery and so on. And again, you know, when you change the measures, the recalculation is done in real time and you see how the system kind of responds to that and, um, by, by comparing the level of resilience. So that's, uh, that's the idea. That's, uh, with this kind of demo, you can guys play, you can demonstrate, you can show, you know, what can be done. Um, and this is why we developed the prototype so that we can uh, try and see if any of the municipalities will be possibly interested to go into real time. And it was interesting. The, the, the response from the city of Toronto was very exciting at the beginning. Um, um, and this is the kind of period of time when you talk to technical people, um, the people who are kind of responsible for um, um, uh, who are responsible for these type of activities within the city. So we had the opportunity to assemble, let's say, the people from transportation group, from the water group, uh, uh, planners, and uh, even the resilience officer. Each of the cities now has the resilience officer. And they were all quite excited. And then the moment came to start developing and supporting development, and that required sharing the data. And this is where we hit the wall. Uh, the, 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 the problems in, you know, started occurring because sharing the data requires approval of the higher uh, uh, managers in the city. And that was then questioned why, in what form the data will be shared, who is going to get the data. And it was in interesting. In my opinion, we got the data that was much more strate of strategic <laughs> importance. For example, we got all the data about energy. Uh, from the local Toronto utility, like the location of the transformers, the transmission lines, and everything, you know, which is strategically quite important. And we were not able to get the digital elevation model that city is using. You know, so, so something very irrational, and, and I am having a very hard time kind of explaining and understanding. So I was putting a lot of effort. I put a probably a year in communication with them and then gave up. And now I am using opportunity to talk about them, you know, at every possible place, you know, in order to, to maybe get some understanding and support that this is stupid <laughs> because it's a, we, 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 didn't, we didn't ask for any funding. I already had the funding. We already had semi-developed system. So it was just to kind of work with them and implement in real time, but didn't work out. Marina, you had a question or? Oh, I thought you had a question. Do you guys have any questions or? Okay, uh, let me, I want to show you the full scale system. It's, it's, it's developed, but as I was pointing out, it's developed with uh, the combination of the data that we got from them and uh, uh, the data that's in the publicly available databases. So uh, <laughs> the, the idea of the prototype is very much, uh, very much followed in the developed, uh, development of the full system except that we tried in the full system to allow a user uh, much more of an input to kind of create what the issue is, what type of hazard you know, is of concern, to uh, create the set of uh, conditions and um, select the impacts, as well as select the response actions and measures for the adaptation. So we didn't want system to basically force anything, uh, but through the set of uh, uh, kind of interactive communications with the system allow a uh, user to put a lot of information into the system. So it's a little bit more demanding in a sense of, you know, how you use the system, but it's also through that giving a lot of flexibility to create the system to meet directly your uh, particular needs. So uh, it, 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 it contains, you know, immediately 
huge uh, amount of the spatial information in the form of various layers. And in order to point out that we don't have all the data of the, you know, that they are using, uh, we identify and separated the information that we took from so-called the public database. This is what I was sharing with you, the, the, the open street map tool. This is a Google tool which is offering for the whole world a lot of municipal information data. Now you need to understand that these open databases are created by people. So you can, for example, enter into the system and if you have some information you can kind of upload this information and it becomes part of this database and everybody else can use it. So, so the issue is the quality and accuracy of the information because it's provided from different sources, from different users. The question is, are these uh, all of the all kind of level of uh, um, accuracy? Uh, anyhow, we wanted to demonstrate the system, develop the system, and that was the only way to go. So the number of, you see, buildings, the critical infrastructure, uh, all other infrastructure was very basically taken from uh, uh, open street maps and all the other kind of information was, uh, was from the real data that was available. So the system has or builds the problem in two different forms. One is uh, identifying the set of uh, networks, infrastructure networks, so in a network format, node, links, and so on and also identifying and overlaying the other information that's not networked, um, like uh, schools, um, uh, hospitals, uh, police stations, because they're individual locations in the spatial maps, and they're treated by the system in two different, um, in two different ways. So uh, the kind of first uh, level of menu and the entrance into the system allows you to actually bring now the data and create your problem domain by selecting the network, um, developing the network, implementing it in a special form, as well as bringing the, we call them layers. So the layers are the other data that's kind of in the form of the spatial layer, but it's not networked in a way. The reason the reason for making the distinction between these two is that, you know, in order to calculate the resilience, you really need to know what is the kind of network part where we applied what I was showing you, you know, the, for the network uh, ways of uh, uh, expressing resilience. And for these layers, we use the kind of uh, spatial just information to calculate the impact and uh, uh, for the uh, layers, so each of the choices kind of comes up with the interactive window and in the window you have this kind of format where you identify the network, you identify type, is it a network or layer, and then you can edit, save, or delete, replace. So uh, with this type of communication, by clicking, you are providing the opportunity now to import the information into the system. For most of these uh, kind of information, you get the direct type of table um, uh, the, or the screens that will be uh, requiring you to put the data in. Um, so there are different ways how you can enter the network information. You can kind of identify that in a graphical form on the screen or you can, through this kind of windows, uh, prepare the data, uh, prepare the data, and then store the data uh, in, the, in the database. So it is a little bit of a kind of um, demanding process. It requires you to kind of fully understand, you know, what are the kind of physical, functional, network, not network, it could, and, and so on, data. But on the other side, it's uh, completely open that you can actually use it for, you know, rain hitting the 
part of the city or someone in, you know, activating the bomb uh, somewhere there because the system is simply ignorant of the type of hazard. Um, everything is pre-specified through the kind of way and set of consequences and that was the intention to make it a little bit more, a little bit more general that can be used. It can be used for, um, you know, technical or chemical spills as well as earthquake or, you know, any other type of hazard. So that's the idea of entering the information about uh, the area being affected, network and the layers. Then the second set of um, information is um, related to identifying the adaptation options, sorry, both. Uh, uh, impacts that you would like to uh, uh, calculate as well as the set of adaptation options that you can use as a response. So for the impacts, uh, we, you again have a set of screens which are kind of identifying uh, how you want to measure the impacts, like say if you're considering flooding, uh, the, de the, the depth damage curves will be required. So you have to actually enter this information into the system, or if you don't have, um, you can actually try to try to point out the system that this information is, you know, not accurate. That you can actually perform some sensitivity analysis. We also have opportunity to um, utilize the spatial information and the water elevation and find out, you know, the change of depth and things like that from the available spatial data that's in the system. So, so lots of opportunities to kind of combine and enter enter the information. So, so the impacts and the impacts can be in all areas, as we are already touching, you know, in the physical as well as economic or social and. Um, the, the only, the only uh, kind of difference here is for any impacts that you want to bring in, you have to provide that way how the impact will be, will be calculated. Um, um, we are providing ways of entering the real data, like a tabular form, depth damage, or we can provide in the way that you can enter so-called the fragility curves, which are the probabilistic relationships between the level of damage and the hazard. Um, we are offering the way to actually enter the information in any other form that you have the information in. And that's, uh, that's, you know, the kind of level of uh, flexibility that we try to build. And I'm sure that it can be further expanded, you know, for different hazards, but uh, that's where we are right now. And the final set of inputs is related to uh, this kind of adaptation options, again, in a proactive and reactive uh, categories. And that's also fully in the, uh, in the user's head. In this particular case, the limitation was not now in the percentage values. You can actually express each measure in the units, in the real units. Uh, the measure is uh, uh, kind of assessed at. And we, uh, I mean, again, you don't have any kind of limitation what type of measure, adaptation measure can be used. It was interesting because this was supported by one of the reinsurance agencies, <coughs> the development was, and, and they were interested to see some of the measures that are of interest to their business, like um, if anything happens to the city, um, and they need to provide insurance, one of the very important measures is how fast you go and you assess how many uh, people you can put to do actually process the claims and so on. So we have the number of you know, people to do that and you can immediately see the kind of response and they were extremely happy with something like that. Um, the point is there is a really very high level of flexibility in that system, but it does the same as, or the main idea is the same as in the demo that I was, um, I was showing. Uh, obviously, you can kind of show the performance and you can show the resilience again with the two pre and post measure. Um, you can show the same, uh, in the same way, all the possible impacts that you would like to uh, use for the system performance. And then you can show the resilience for each of the components. 
like a social or economic resilience and so on. And you can show the total graph which kind of puts everything together and give you the kind of resilience of the whole, of the whole, uh, for the total resilience for the rich. And that's, that's about it, guys. So um, I think we have succeeded in a way to demonstrate what can be done. I think there is a lot of potential potential to utilize um, this idea um, that the, the effort is necessary to kind of bring the system to uh, the functional form and satisfy the needs, but you realize that you need to have a real partner in doing that, and we in the city of Toronto, we were not able to get that partnership. Um, again, um, a lot of this stuff is being, uh, is being published. For those of you who may be interested in a full-scale system, you can run it, it's on the web. And we provided this technical document, this is again the blue book, which is a kind of manual that can lead you through. And we also provided with the system five examples, five different examples that you can actually see how you can uh, uh, use the system and how you go through the process of kind of preparing these input tables, uh, selecting measures, identifying the impacts and so on. So these five examples are prepared in a way that if you enter the system and you kind of uh, run, follow the one, and uh, my suggestion is use the, use the blue book and simply by reading you kind of go through the steps uh, the system will be responding and doing what is expected, but at the end, the results will not be uh, saved if you generate the different results from the exam. So we fixed uh, these five uh, examples to remain in the same form so that other users can be kind of utilizing them. Uh, you can create, obviously, your own example, but then it will not be uh, saved uh, as the one that others can access, they can be only used by you and you can utilize the system the way you want. Uh, ob obviously the system is now storing the data for the city kind of, of Toronto, but I think it's a, it's, a, it's a good source to maybe show if you find out someone who may be an interesting partner to uh, uh, to implement something like this, maybe even to see what, you know, t up to what level the information is available in the Brazilian communities that you can do something. You may need to kind of simplify some, uh, uh, s simplify some of the aspects, but I think it's a good example uh, that demonstrates the use of resilience. And that's where we are. You guys have any questions, comments? You like? Do you like it or not? Yes. Yeah. For the for the prototype for the prototype uh, development because all the all the work on the flooding and everything was done. We utilized the results from the previous studies. Basically, there were three of us. Andre was uh, your colleague from uh, Sao Paulo, was the guy who was leading the development of the decision support system. And we had, uh, we had the one master student that was basically providing, collecting all the information, coordinating with him, you know, bringing this information in. And that was her, that was her thesis. Um, on the city of Toronto, we had a little bit larger uh, group. We had uh, two more, so Andre, myself, and two more uh, guys. Um, the Howard Tong was uh, one master student, and then we had another master student. So basically, four of us over the period. Uh, this this system was approximately three years of work. The both prototype and and, and this one. But you have to understand that Andre is one of the extremely capable guys in programming. So he is the, he is the person who can easily kind of do the database stuff work, inter, you know, interface stuff work. The models are mostly developed and we all have them. It's just integrating them. But kind of putting this decision support format together, you have to have experience. And he really had that experience and that was 
uh, that was that was useful. Uh, Sarah Sarah was working on the prototype, and uh, uh, she was also she was also extremely capable person and very resourceful person in kind of communicating with the cities and getting uh, uh, the information. Howard was mostly in involved in developing certain components of the system. So like uh, when you try to enter into the system, the network, um, the networks can be created in various ways. Um, so uh, there are certain kind of modeling, numerical aspects of the graph theory that we needed to kind of bring in. And for example, he would develop that. Andre would implement that, and then we would test that, you know, with the data and so on. So that was the that was the way. Um, the the funding we were lucky that basically we had a relatively a relatively free <laughs> funding. There was a large the project is still kind of going on. Different components. I am using the funds for the network that I was showing you, you know, and trying to generalize the multi-hazard network model, a uh, resilience model. But uh, the uh, reinsurance guys were really open for the kind of flexible use of funds. And we would, for example, propose and demonstrate something like this to them, and they were, you know, very happy. Um, but on the other side, those who I wanted to attract, I was not able to fully succeed in that. Any other questions, comments? I have yeah, yeah. How long? For what? For for the population. So, but we we have actually, I think, all the historical the the the, uh, the stats. Canada keeps all the data. The problem is that they are uh, collecting or updating, let's say, the data every six years. Six years. And what was happening in the last census? They changed the methodology. And many people were uh, very unhappy because now the time series up to last census was obtained in one way and then from last census in another way. So you need to be kind of aware that, you know, things are... We didn't go into that. This is like, you know, this is something that kind of Statistics Canada is, is, is doing. And for us or for the studies like this, it's important to know, you know, the information about that. Um, <coughs> if, you're, if you want to use the kind of system for some kind of historical events and so on, it will be important to dig out this older information. For us now is actually the, the most current information is what is in the system and what's important for the system. Any yes. other? Every 10 years, yeah. It's a costly process, and I understand. But I don't know why they changed the kind of methodology. It was something in a way how you collect the data and then how you process and then, you know, interpolate and things like that. So, okay, um, if, uh, if you guys don't have any comments or questions, um, we'll make a break now. And then, you know, I don't know, how long do you want to break? 20 minutes? Or? Okay. Guys, and 20 minutes.